thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I uh, uh, intensely appreciate you being here on a lovely day to be in a darkened room to listen to an academic. Uh, I, I, I don't know what you were thinking. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk today about machines. Uh, in fact, in particular, I'm going to talk about two machines, computers and people. The notion here is that um, I'm really going to talk, be talking about what we are um, from the perspective, in many ways, of, uh, of what we are now doing with computation. Um, and I think one of the more important things to start with is to realize who I am. Um, and that is, I uh, build intelligent machines. Um, uh, I'm in computer science, but my focus is artificial intelligence. That is, building machines that uh, think the way we do. Um, in particular, it's important for you to understand that ever since I was a tiny child, tiny child, um, uh, I loved the idea of intelligent machines, uh, intelligent robots, uh, intelligent computers, uh, things that would help us, things that would try to kill us. And I loved them, even in those moments where people said uh, they were trying to kill us. And I believe, at the time, I was one of the very few people who, after seeing 2001 A Space Odyssey, actually thought that Hal, uh, after trying to wipe out the entire ship he was on, wipe out all the people on that ship, got a bad rap. Um, it wasn't that he was evil. He wanted to achieve his mission, and no one told him, by the way, while you're achieving your mission, don't kill everybody. Um, uh, but we have, a, um, uh, we have a, an interesting world ahead of us now. And the thing I care about in looking at this world is the issue of uh, intelligence. Uh, intelligence in uh, all of its forms. Because I really do believe that there are three big questions in the world. Uh, the first is the one that we've seen for um, years, and that is the nature of the physical world. Physics and chemistry. How do the things work at an atomic, a molecular, a field level? The second one is the nature of life and how it arose. Um, uh, biology, um, uh, evolution, uh, ecological systems. And the third is intelligence, the nature of intelligence. Uh, the physical world, the biological world, uh, the intellectual world. Those are the three big questions that we have in front of us. And from my perspective, looking at that, um, the issue is cognition is cognition. It doesn't matter if it's human cognition. It doesn't matter if it's machine cognition. All that matters is that it's cognition. Now, it turns out that we have a horrible relationship with machine intelligence. I mean, a really devastatingly bad relationship with machine intelligence. Um, um, most of it has to do with bad press. Um, uh, but we, have a, we struggle uh, with thinking about intelligent machines. Uh, first of all, we think they're going to kill us, which is fine. I mean, uh, we've been told this for years, uh, uh, all the way from uh, uh, Colossus to HAL uh, to the Terminator. Um, we've seen killer machines um, uh, you know, in film all of our lives. Um, more recently, uh, we've got this notion also that uh, they're going to take our jobs. That is, they are going to take over everything that we can do, um, and we will be left alone in the dark with machines running everything. One of the ways we fight this is we doubt it. Um, that is, we think of ourselves as being different, unique, and that there will be nothing, absolutely nothing, that the machine will be able to do or that, we, that, uh, that the machine, there will be absolutely nothing um, that we will be able to do to build machines that can do all of the things that we can do. And so we defend ourselves. And straightforwardly, we look at examples of our own decision making. And we talk about the machine making those decisions in terms of being cold, being cold and calculated and, and having absolutely no emotion or affect or anything while we uh, develop emotional, deep, fundamental relationships with things. Because the reality is, we are terrified of the idea that we will be able to program a thing that is like us. Because if we can program a thing that is like us, 
then maybe we were programmed or are programmable. And so we struggle all the time to protect uh, what is different and unique about us. But what is it about us? What is it that makes us special? What do we have that the machine will never be able to do? Well, there are a bunch of things that we sort of start off with when we think about our battle with the machine. Um, and I think you've probably heard most of them. It's the idea that, well, machines will never have emotion or creativity or humor or intuition or consciousness. In fact, consciousness is always interesting because whenever you say, oh, and this machine became conscious, the next sentence is, and then tried to kill us all. <laughs> it's always the case. Uh, but the thing is, is that the others, the other first three are interesting and important, but today I just want to talk a little bit about intuition and consciousness. Uh, because those are the things that we really think of as being fundamental. That we are, have, we are able to make decisions intuitively, and we have an awareness of the world. Now, there is a, a kind of irony here in terms of these two features that are our, our protection uh, in terms of us being human beings. Uh, and that is that intuition, think about intuition. Intuition is the ability to make decisions without quite knowing why we're making a decision. And consciousness, consciousness is the notion that we are always aware of our thoughts. We are aware of our thoughts, we are aware of the external world. We are sort of there in and amongst our, ourselves. But that means that we are in this funny position that we are not conscious by definition of the processes that give us intuition. Um, so these two are absolutely opposite sides of uh, the coin of reasoning that makes us up. So let's think about intuition for just one second. We all know what it's like to sort of follow our gut. We don't have enough evidence. We're going to have to make a guess. Um, uh, and in fact, it, it's often the case that there'll be that tension uh, within um, um, uh, people who are logical and people who are intuitive saying, I don't want to hear the numbers. I'm going with my gut. I don't care about the evidence. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Come on, I've seen this a thousand times before. I'm going for it. Um, and in fact, almost every you know, genuinely famous and successful person um, has said something about intuition, about how wonderful intuition is, how fantastic intuition is. Um, there is something, there's something called uh, survivor's bias. Uh, and that is, uh, when you take a look at the people who do really well, you ask what features actually are associated with them doing really well. And many of them will say intuition. Of course, intuition is also a feature that's associated with people doing badly. Uh, that is, making guesses. Turns out that smart people make really good guesses. Um, and uh, not so smart people make bad guesses. But it all comes down to, it all comes down to coming to a decision, coming to an understanding of what's happening in the world, assessing what's happening without knowing why. Uh, and we look at the machine and we think, well, machines don't do that. They're all based on rules. But that's not the case. Um, machines are already incredibly intuitive. Um, I mean, astoundingly intuitive. Um, which is to say, a lot of the work that you're seeing nowadays in the world of what's called uh, deep learning is all about building up a machine's intuition. That is giving a machine an example after an example after an example and having it slowly learn from all those examples until it hits the point where it can look at a new situation and say, I know what's going on here and come up with an answer. Um, and this is what we see when we have things like uh, image recognition on Facebook, Siri being able to understand your words, um, the self-driving cars knowing how to adjust themselves on the road. Now what's amazing is that these machines are intuitive in the sense that they can make decisions, but they cannot articulate why they're making those decisions. There are no rules there anymore. There are networks of thinking that we've built and we train so, people, so the machines can make these decisions. But the question is, do we want machines that do that? Do we want machines to be able to make decisions without being able to explain themselves? In general, people, the answer to that is no. If I have a self-driving car that runs somebody over in order to save somebody else's life, I actually would like it to be able to explain itself to me. Right? Um, if I have a, a system that's making a decision about somebody's future, I want it to be able to explain itself to me. 
So for us, we look at machines making decisions without knowing why. This seems odd. And the question is, when we look at people, uh, perhaps we should consider that that's odd as well. That is, to, the ability to make a decision without understanding why you're making a decision might be a human ability. But perhaps we should aspire to have it be the decisions we made are un make are understandable, are explainable, um, are brought into a different kind of realm that's not the gut, um, uh, but is brought back up into the brain. Well, along with intuition, the other side of this is consciousness. Um, and consciousness is very special for us. Um, it's this notion that um, we're aware. You all have, right now, a conscious awareness of what you're seeing, what I'm saying, where you're sitting, what you're thinking. There are other things going on in your head besides what's going on in the outside world. And this is what it means to be for you, which is to say we're looking at the world outside us, we're looking at the things inside us, and we're hooked to those things. So it's this awareness of the internal and the external. Now the thing of it is, um, as we are looking at that, um, the question is, what does this actually mean in our lives? What does this consciousness do for us? Um, what role does it play in us as, as things that exist in the world? What does it mean to be aware of ourselves? Well, for me, sort of the pivot point in understanding this is push-ups. So um, if you do 50 push-ups every single morning for the rest of your life, you will be healthier and you will live longer. That's just the way it is. Um, uh, my guess is that once you decide that, you say, I'm going to do 50 push-ups every morning for the rest of my life, the next morning you're going to wake up and you're going to go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I, you know, I got things to do. I got I to brush, but I got to shower. I got to get downstairs. Oh, my God, I'm late. I'm not going to do it. And the next morning it's like, oh, I'm going to do 50 push ah, ha, man. <laughs> so you're in this odd situation where you know uh, you want to do something, and you still don't want to do something. But if the part of you that wants to do push-ups, it gets a little pushy, and says to the part of you that's saying, hi, 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 and say, no, today we're doing push-ups, damn it. We're doing 50 push-ups today. And you do 50 push-ups today, and then you force that part of you to do 50 push-ups the next day, and the next day, and the next day, for 30 days or 45 days, then the part of you that didn't want to do push-ups wants to do push-ups now. It knows that you're supposed to get up in the morning. And even when you don't want to do push-ups anymore, it says, we're doing push-ups today. <laughs> God damn it, we're doing push-ups. Um, that is to say, you can train yourself to do push-ups every day, which is a little odd in terms of an allocution. You're training yourself as though there's two pieces of you. And then think about memory. You've all had a moment where you couldn't remember the name of somebody. It's like, who did play? Who played? Um, who played Commissioner Gordon in the Christopher Nolan Batman films? It's like, ah, oh, I can't remember his name. He played, he did, he just did Churchill. He won a, an Oscar, I guess. He, uh, he did Sid and Nancy years ago. Oh, it's Gary Ullman. Which is to say that you have a memory. And sometimes when you ask a me your memory a question, it can't quite get to the answer. But you know how to manipulate that question and ask it more and more questions until you get an answer which is to say, memory is not quite you. You're aware of memory, but it's not quite you. It's a thing you can use. And I would say the same thing when you're thinking about driving a car. Because sometimes when you're driving a car, you kind of go along and you forget. You're just driving along. You're not thinking about which lanes you're moving in. You're not thinking about what's in front of you. But something's taking care of business for you. Particularly if you've got a, a route that you go along every day. You just drive it. And you can think about other things while you're driving. And we have these activities we do that we don't think about. We just let something else take care of those things. Um, sometimes, though, when there's suddenly something stopping in front of us, we see a, uh, a pedestrian right in front of us, our consciousness comes into play and takes control again. But often, we're sort of moving through the world, not automatically, just not in a way that we're aware of. Which is to say, what we're really looking at is a world where we don't have one unified mind. What we have is 
a set of different components that make us up and a consciousness that brings those components together. And the notion is, is that for things like memory, we ask memory, our memories a question over and over and over, different kinds of questions until we get an answer. Um, when we're looking at things like uh, perception, perception comes at us um, and gives us information, and sometimes we ignore it. So sometimes you forget exactly where your legs are while you're sitting until it matters, and then you're aware again. Um, and then the actions we take in the world. Most of them are automatic. Um, but sometimes um, we can train and retrain um, our, our body and our, our, our emotion, our, our body and our control. And what we end up with are these things that look like black boxes that we access and we can program. But think about that. Black boxes that we access and program. Things that look like uh, um, devices that are part of us that we don't completely understand. My guess is you can all, you all see, but you don't understand how vision works. You hear, but you don't how, understand how your auditory system works. You can remember, but you don't know how your memory works. You can move your arms and legs and go throughout the world, but you don't know how that works. But something in you does. Uh, but your consciousness controls that thing and talks to that thing. So we have all these things that we do that look like a central unit and all these subsystems that it interacts with. But that's how computer programs work. And I'm not talking about intelligent programs, I'm talking about any program. It has a th the core and then subsystems that interact with it. And in particular, when we're talking about intelligent systems, we're looking at things where you've a, a, a controller and then these subsystems that are almost always opaque. That is what we call uh, APIs, um, that are opaque to the core system. Um, and so you might think of a machine as just having a whole bunch of data and analytics. But the reality is, it's got these sensors, and it doesn't know how they work, but it gets information. It's got actors, things that can take action in the world. It doesn't know how they work, but it can tell it what to do. Combined with things that make decisions and draw inferences, that understand language, that generate language. And now in the current world, do machine learning and deep learning, um, use evidence to base its reasoning, um, have do text analysis, all these things coming together into a central repository. And so th the structure of how we build intelligence in a machine is not unlike at all the structure that allows intelligence to exist for us. Um, and this relationship between a controller and the things being controlled, a central unit um, that is aware of what's happening, uh, but doesn't know exactly how every single component works, is core to intelligence. Now, the reason why I care about this, the reason why I care about this is straightforward. Our future is our, a partnership with these machines. Our future is actually interacting with these machines. Um, and in order to have that future work, we have to think about how to humanize them, make them more and more like us every day. Because if we don't make them like us, um, we have to be like them. The less human the machines are, the more mechanized we have to become. And so by humanizing them, we save ourselves from being mechanized. Uh, now, doing this does not diminish us. The fact that we can build intelligence into a thing that is like our intelligence does not take anything away from us. Uh, in fact, it's part of the celebration of being intelligent that we can turn that gift into a gift for others, a gift for machines. And I always like to go back to Carl Sagan um, in terms of thinking about this. Um, Carl Sagan said a beautiful thing at one point, and that is we are made of star stuff. We are made of all the things that are part of the cosmos. I think it's much more important to understand that we are made of the same things as rocks and dirt and mud and trees. We are made of the things that are at the base of creation. But what's astounding is that although we are made of those things, we can reason. That is, we can think. We can do this astounding thing. Um, and it's not because of the glorious stuff we are made of. It is in spite of what we are made of. Um, 
And we are now in a place where we can take that gift, that marvelous gift of intelligence, of reasoning, of consciousness, of the ability to look at the world and know what to do, to decide and think and infer and know and bring it to the machine. And that, uh, that will be for us, I think, one of the pinnacles of what it means for us to be intelligent as a species. That's it.